Anyway, so yeah, this game is called Rats in Ear, and when we saw the game, at least I was immediately attracted to it because, as the name implies, it is a combination of rats, squeak, squeak, uh, eating pizza, and also buccaneers, yar, we are pirates, let us be cute pirate rats, pirates, who are cute, I don't know why they didn't translate it to pirate, but Rats in Ear is okay, uh, yeah, it's a game where you are pirate rats trying to out-pirate the other pirate rats. So it's not a great game. It's not in the class of, like, Tiggers and Euphrates. I mean, the theme, though. The theme. The theme's good. Yeah. And the game is relatively unique in that there are few games that use a mechanic like this. I cannot... There are not many games that you can compare this game to mechanically, no. The game... But the game has a lot of the... Ele- like, I feel like a game that was meteor that did some of the things this game does would be very much up my alley. Mm. and But this game is good. It's a good game to bust out at a convention because it generates a lot of moments where everyone goes, oh, shit, really? And something crazy happens. So first of all, the game is really cute. There's a, the, I was immediately attracted to these pieces in the game, one of which had a tiny cute rat and a little red and white floaty rat. There are only two images of this game on Board Game Geek. Yeah, uh, which is the cutest little rat I've ever seen. And then I was told that that is the rat king of the sea. <laughs> The Rat King of the Land is pretty good, though. The Rat King of the Land is also cute, but not as cute as the Rat King of the Sea with the red and white floaty. (laughs) The floaty is what does it. Yeah, I'm all about the Rat King of the Sea. I almost thought about making that a Twitter avatar. So the theme is your rat pirates, whatever. But the the gist of the game... The main mechanic that matters... You do a blind bid for where you're going to go on this chain of islands. Everyone's got two pirates, and you never get more, and you could get some deckhands, but whatever. You basically secretly allocate to... There's a chain of islands from the land out to the treasure island in a straight line. And you allocate secretly where you're going to send your pirates and your deckhands. So you'd be like, I'll send a pirate to Island 1. And, and I'll send a pirate. I'll, yeah, I'll send a pirate to the Magical Treasure Island and a pirate to this middle island and a deckhand on the land and so forth. Right? And the islands all have goods that you're going to do some stuff all with. All the islands do stuff. Whatever. The tre- well, the islands all have goods on them. Yeah. The Treasure Island has crazy bullshit yeah. on it. You re- everyone reveals and then simultaneously and sends out their pirates and deckhands to the thing. But. Starting at the land, where I guess the tavern is, right? Where the money is. You go is. in order. You do the thing on the first place, you then go the second in order, place, then the third place. And as soon as you reach a spot in the chain, it's just a straight line, where there nobody sent anybody, no one sent a pirate, no one sent a deckhand, no one sent anything to that spot. All of the islands further out in the chain, everyone just gets swept away to the beach and doesn't get to do that stuff. So it's really hard to do the treasure island because to do the treasure island, you need to have something on every single other spot, something to keep that chain alive so that I guess you can get home safely with your treasure. Now, you also, this leads to those situations where every round, especially later in the game, people are thinking... Did anyone go on Space One? Please, I hope someone went on Space One. There are a lot of times where no one goes on Space One and everyone gets washed away to the beach. Yep. The end. Now, the rest of the game is pretty simple mechanically. Like, it's not even that exciting. Yeah, each of the different islands does something. The first space just gives you money. The second space lets you buy helping cards and and more deckhands. All the other normal spaces are all the same, and they have cards that line up next to them that have goods, and the goods become victory points. And then the, at the very end is the treasure island. And there's, I think there's another one that lets you flip victory points and, and then the beach. Yep. Whatever. The game is only of sort of moderate actual depth. Yeah, in the terms main of mechanic is the, the main mechanic that's fun and interesting and that you care about is the one I just described where you want to send your guys deep. But if you do, they might just get washed away to the beach and sort of risk and also looking what other players are going to do. And if you fill in stuff... But trying to guess what they're going to do and then, you know... If you fill in stuff to go deep, you're giving other people potentially a stepping stone to go deeper. Right. And if you, you know, you look at some spaces in the middle and it's like, well, that's a really good spot to go. But if I go there, Rim also goes there. He's going to... I'm going to get less stuff. But wait, if I don't go there, Rim's going to go there alone and take all the stuff. So here's where this guy has another level of that same sort of like guessing what the other people are going to do and anticipating and risk taking is that all the islands where you get stuff if you're there by yourself you get all the stuff yeah if you're there with other people you take turns based on some rules and who gets stuff you're basically looting cargo ships but if one of those islands has fights on it you gotta win the fight otherwise when, everyone dies and goes to the beach and when you win the fight fu- if you win the fight the dudes you use to fight the fight generally die so unless ideally you, unless you have cards but 
all the people on that island share the fight and the results together. So if you so, get someone else to fight, you get the, you can get treasures by joining in. So there's multiple levels but of... But if you go there and then no one else goes to fight there, you could just die. Multiple levels of anticipating what other people might do and planning on that and risk-taking based on that. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of strategy, the, the trouble with the game is that really... The only thing, like, the strategy is pretty simple. You play conservatively when you're ahead, and, well, in the sense that you play easy plays early in the board, and you don't ever give people opportunities to go deeper, because why would you? If you're already ahead, and there's a turn where no one gets to do anything, you stay ahead. Mm -hmm. And if you're losing, you take increasingly desperate, risky strategies to try to go deeper, to try to get a big payoff because you're hoping that nobody went on the place with three fights and you get all the goods. Mm -hmm. And that's really the only strategy involved. Yeah, I mean, but that's the interesting part, right? What other, yeah. what other game does that? Most of the risk-reward games are games of, like, pushing, like, you know, uh, no thanks, where it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, yep. and then you take it. Or but those games don't rely on anticipation. Where infiltration, where you go deeper and deeper and deeper, and then turn back, right? Or Deep Sea Adventure, where you go deeper and turn well, back. Let's, let's talk about and all this examples. game, every single turn, it's like, how deep is it safe to go? Every single turn, you're making a brand new judgment. Deep Sea Adventure. And you're getting severely punished for going too deep. Is the splendor of that kind of game. But it's then the you most can try minimal again. experience. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Entdecker has that to a big degree. A little bit. Entdecker, when you're exploring, that's the how much are you going to risk? What's the risk reward ratio? Mm -hmm. But most of these games, the risk taking is independent of anticipating what other players will do. Like in Infiltration, it's obvious what other players will do because the game's actually. Infiltration, I have. You don't have as much freedom. I have an increasingly dour opinion of because the game always plays out the same way and you have very little agency mm. it takes too long for what you get out of it that's true and there is it is almost never viable to go even halfway into that stupid place you need some luck to get deep you need a lot of luck to go deep unlike deep sea adventure where you can get the big treasures for yep right near is a pretty good balance of these mechanics and you get to have that go deep or not, anticipate other players over and over and over again. My only complaint, and I'm not going to complain that the game's a little random with the cards, because it is, but that's not bad. That's fine for this level of game. My only complaint is the game takes about 10 to 15 minutes longer than it feels like it should. Yeah, My complaint with the luck, actually, in this game is that you have the land uh, seat rat king and the water rat king, yep. right? the cutest pieces, and they rotate around the board fairly, so everyone gets a roughly even number of times as both. And basically what those do is they allow you to either have priority on the land spaces or priority on the water spaces. Which gives you more context to decide right. so what when, other players right. are going to so do. So when you are the sea rat king, you want to play your guys out in the water and you will get first dibs even if someone goes to the same space you go to. But everyone knows you're going to do that. Obviously, but I mean, you just do it anyway because you still get first dibs. What are they going to do about it, right? Yep. And then if you go land, you're the land rat king, you also get first dibs. You can get more money or more cards or whatever before other people and so they rotate evenly, and it's kind of fair. But the thing is, there's a lot of situations where, for example, I was the sea rat king once, and no one went on the one space. Just coincidence that time. And I had a good play, and I just, oh, I got, I got burned. And I, that's, you're only going to get to be the sea rat king like two or three times. GG. I basically lost right there. Why would you take that risk? I didn't, you know, how was I, why would I go on the land space when I'm the sea rat king? You right? put one deck hand there as insurance. I just, but I'm just saying, it's like, you know. It's well, you know, there's risk reward. This game, you literally can spend actions, which are the primary economy in the game because you don't get many. Yep. To buy insurance. Yep. By putting a deckhand somewhere to insure I'm that just that saying, place. You know, it's just a thing that can happen, right? It could be not even getting a big, not that's that's an example of really big bad luck, yeah. right? I'm talking about a little bad luck. Like, oh, I was the sea rat king, and there really weren't any good islands to go to. Like, there weren't a lot of cards out there to pick up on when I happened to be the sea rat king because of the way the turns went. And then I, so I, you know, I did what the best I could and whatever. And then I passed the sea rat king to the left and suddenly all these amazing diamonds get dealt out. And now the person to the left of me is the oh, sea rat king diamonds. And, oh. and they get all these victory points by going to this awesome Island. And because I was just the sea rat king, I have more, I have like no priority on water. I have priority on land. I can't get those victory points just because luck 
Yep. I mean, it, now, it, that's why I say board the game games needs have, to be. I'm not saying this is bad. Board games have luck. That's a thing. But that's why I'm saying the it's game not, needs to be like 15 minutes shorter. Yeah, it doesn't ruin the game. It's just, it's a thing. If the game were shorter, that would be less of a concern because you just play it again. Yep. Uh, the other funny thing, as Demo Weasel just pointed out in the chat, it's not localized so well. Well, yeah, there's some really funny things like so the there's bogus a, money artisan. Yes, there's a car. There's there's cards for the special rats that you can buy on the land at the tavern. A few of them are basically like translated wrong. So right, like few, the surgeon is the thief. Yeah, they they wrote the wrong words on them. But the the uh the best one the is bogus the, money artisan, the counterfeiter who gives you like a money every turn, basically uh something like that. But instead of saying counterfeiter, it says bogus money artisan, which is amazing. I will, at any point in my life where there is an opportunity to say the word counterfeit, I'm going to say bogus something artisan Well, instead. say bogus money and say bogus money artisan. Yeah, but it could be bogus anything. I mean, we're going to do a Geek Nights episode in the future bog- on the bogus, bogus board game artisan. Are you a bogus MP3 artisan? <laughs> <laughs> is that what you are? But I would say that if you are the kind of person who whips out games for people. Like, you're the kind of person who brings a game to your group and says, hey, let's play this game. It's cool. This is a game to have. This is a game that a lot of people you bring games yep. for have not played before. Right. Also, it's people haven't played this. It has cute rats that can bring people in. It has a cute pirate theme that you can get into. It's pretty cool. Even though teach. it has some problems, you can still get enjoyment out of it multiple times. Uh, it's easy to learn. It's quick to learn. Even though it's too long for what it is, it's still not long to play overall. Yep. Uh, and it's unique. It's not like other games. You have this unique mechanic that make it worth playing. There isn't like some replacement game that's like, oh, you shouldn't play Rat Near, play this instead. It's like, there isn't really a game that I've seen that has that chain connection mechanic that's really interesting. Uh, I almost sort of feel like it's a fear in... Uh, it's obviously nothing like Fury of Dracula, except Fury of, Dra- uh, Fury of Dracula has the Dracula's hidden movement mechanic. That which is, is un- amazing. That is unlike any other game, and the rest of the game is meh. Ratnir has the chain c- simultaneous placement mechanic, which is unique and unlike any other game, and the rest of the game is a game. If we could make the, make the combat in Fury of Dracula act somehow like this blind bid system in Ratnir. So basically take two unique systems and combine them, and that's the whole game? Yep. Just- Two really interesting, unique systems together. I feel like that could work. Go for it. That goes against most of the advice we give people for designing games. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, you know, definitely, I think, you know, there was so much attention on the Euro games. I'm glad we have some friends who pay attention to the uh, Japanese produced yep, board because games because frankly, out there. I haven't been, I do not have time to pay attention to that right no, now. And I'm sure there are other countries besides Japan and European Union that are produ- and United States that are producing quite excellent tabletop games, and I would like to see some of those. Please translate them and deliver them to us forthwith. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.